This video is made available by the Berea College Computer Science Department under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 4.0 license. Good morning. This is a one take, one pass video, so I apologize if there are any mistakes in it. There was a good question after class on Wednesday that I thought illustrated the uh, an example of functional abstraction that uh, was, was reasonably compelling. And that's how can we use functions and pass them and take advantage of them to simplify our code. So the question had to do with Manhattan distance on a path. So as you may recall, we had a path and it, the path was a struct. It had a start, which was a geo, it had an end, which was a geo. So struct path, start, and end. And I'm going to make that transparent. We also had geos, which were latitude and longitudes. So it had a lat, which was a number, and it had a lon, which was a number. So we had a struct called geo, and it had a lat and a lon field. We'll make that transparent as well. So when I say that a path contains two geos. It doesn't really change our declaration, but it does change how we comment it and how we think about it, because we want to make sure that a path always contains a geo. So now if I'm going to write my Manhattan distance, um, it's going to consume a path, and it's going to return a number. So it might look something like this. And now I need to fill in the dot, dot, dot. I'm given a path. A path is a data structure. A data structure has parts. So what I definitely know is that I'm probably going to need to do something where I get the path start. I'm going to do something where I need to get the path end. So right there is a first step for me in terms of decomposing my problem and figuring out what is it I need to do. The path start is a geo. And for me to calculate Manhattan distance, it's a change in x and a change in y, or if you will, a change in latitude and a change of, in longitude, and they're added. It's like going along city blocks. So the result of this right here is a geo. When I get the path start of P, it gives me back a geo. And that has both a latitude and a longitude. So really, I could do this. Geo lat and geo lon. So I could say I've got the path start. When I get the path start, it's a geo. Then I can pull both parts of the geo out. Cool. So that means down here I'm going to have a geolat of the end point and a geo longitude of the end point. Hmm. And to calculate Manhattan distance, I need the latitude of the end and the start. And I need the latitude of longitude of the end and the start. And I'm going to do this going to do a subtraction because you subtract one from the other. Oops. And we really should have an absolute value of that subtraction. Notice my indentation has gone wonky, so I'm going to check my parentheses. And I'm hitting tab to re-indent. So now I've got the absolute value of the difference between the start and end of the latitude and the absolute value of the start and end of the longitude. And I think at this point I can probably add those two values. I should have written some tests first. And let's, I'm going to sort of cheat here. The distance between 1 comma 1 and 2 comma 2 
should be 2. So if I want to calculate the Manhattan distance of a path that has a geo that's 1, 1 and a geo that's 2, 2, it should give me back 2. If I run it, I don't get any errors. And we can even highlight this and put it down here. Yeah. All right. Now, what I don't like about this is this really doesn't leverage anything in terms of um, we could write some functions to clean this up a little bit. So for example, I might write delta lat. Delta lat can take a point and it can do this. And now if I say delta lat of p, I should be able to, oops, I don't really want to say, I might edit that out. If I say delta lat of p, um, I should be able to run my code, still no errors, escape p to go to the last thing, produces the same result. Well, it should. All I did was copy, cut and paste this code, delta ln of p. Let's add another function, delta, uh, sorry, define delta ln of a path. And what's nice is now I really should be able to be writing, I should be writing delta lat takes a p and it returns a number. Delta ln takes a p and it returns a number. And I can now write checks for these smaller functions. That's really important as our code grows in complexity, that we know that the functions that are at the bottom are doing the right thing. Now, um, when I run my code, I'm still getting a good Manhattan distance. I kind of like that. Um, but what I'm starting to see is that delta lat and delta ln look really similar. Like if I just look at them, I see that it's an absolute value of the subtraction of two values. And I take the start and the end point of a path in both cases. So the only difference is this function right here. In the case of delta lat, I'm getting the latitude out of the geo. In the case of delta ln, I'm getting the, G, the ln out of the geo. This is a really nice place where we could do an abstraction over these two functions. So what if I introduce a new function called delta? It takes a path and an accessor, which is going to be actually a function, and it returns a number. I'm going to call that function accessor. because that's what geolat and geolon are. They're accessors. So now I say that my function delta, I'm sorry, takes a path and a function, and we will use whatever function I pass in to access information in the geos that come back from path start and path end. I could now redefine delta lat as being delta of p, and I pass in delta lat, geo lat. Delta ln becomes delta p of, with geo ln as the accessor. If I run my code, I still get the same answers because what I'm doing is saying I want to calculate a difference on this path structure and I want to access this field of the geos in that path. So now I'm actually passing this function up here and using it twice to pull data out of the geo structures. Now I really, I could keep these two, I could keep delta lat and delta ln for readability. That is, as a human being, I kind of like the idea of having those specialized names, but I could also just as well do this.
I could come all the way down to my Manhattan function and just use delta. Now I've gone from a fairly long program to a rather short program, and it becomes a lot easier for me to write tests to make sure that delta works correctly and Manhattan works correctly. I can put my require unit at the top, perhaps. Um, but that is an example of how, as you iterate over your program solution and you start to see um, patterns, that you don't just have to look for patterns in your data and extract those out as parameters, but you can actually look for patterns in function usage and pull functions out and pass them as you need to. Um, it's something that comes with time and practice, but I thought I'd highlight that one for you because it seemed like a really nice example that cleaned up the code uh, and illustrated the use of that kind of abstraction in a clean way.